Hi, and welcome to our session on digital twins. And I'm joined by William, who is in fact global digital twin lead. How are you, William? I'm doing well, thank you. So I guess I should start by saying, where are you in the world? Uh, I am in New York City. Excellent. And then the next obvious question is for people that don't really know what a digital twin is, I think you and I should start our discussion by kind of defining what that term is and at least what it what it means in your context. What's your kind of pencil sketch of what a digital twin is? It's a great first place to start because the definition means a lot of different things to different people. Um, it's often confused with a twin of a thing, of a product, but the definition that I go with is a 3D asset that is a digital facsimile of a physical product. So there's a lot of like um, breadth to digital twins because it's actually a really powerful concept. And I guess to a certain extent, the boundaries aren't like clearly, you know, black and white defined, but it's more than like if I made a, I don't know, car for a TV commercial that was just something that I sort of designed and did. That's really not what we're talking about when we're talking about digital twin. We're not just talking about some any asset that you guys may have anywhere that is made by anyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, that's a very good point to to start with because the beyond just the definition of a digital twin, it's the use case. And there's many use cases for the this digital asset. So a digital twin also refers to a, an asset you could add into this as part of the definition an asset that's being created at scale so if we're creating taking the automotive example if we're taking a full line of an oem's fleet of passenger vehicles for the season you're talking about every vehicle trim and package is being created using the cad data as the source material the cad data that you use to design the product as the source material that is visualized and the the fundamental difference between a 3D asset for a linear television spot that's created for uh, for a one off execution versus a 3D twin is that you're repurposing that asset in many different ways in different platforms so that it's being created once but repurposed or served many times. Yeah, there are lots of really interesting characteristics that like don't define the twin per se, but pop up mm -hmm. with twins. In other words, like they, they're not limited to this, but like a couple of them that I want to discuss today is like simulation, uh, like mm -hmm. emulating and doing stuff. This idea you just said of like being able to do things at scale. And then quickly you bump into interactivity and the idea that it's going to allow people to do things. Um, mm -hmm. But also, like, you know, other industries and other areas are also doing twinning work that's phenomenal. Like, um, so I guess mm -hmm. there's like the automotive one. I think we should discuss that mm -hmm. in a second. The other one that struck me that came in really early was architectural um, mm -hmm. in the sense that they were like trying to do a full simulation of some kind of architectural environment. And they were looking to simulate everything from mm -hmm. sunlight to wind patterns. Um, mm -hmm. And like those early two use cases proved incredibly valuable, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the idea of a, of, of a twin for uh, the automotive space is was that they were an early adopter in, of CAD for design. And so they're going on about four decades, five decades of using uh, computer-aided design in the engineering process. And the idea of being able to see something that does not physically exist, but the need for an exact replica or a again a digital facsimile of what that what that product will look like uh, has a lot of use cases and from a marketing perspective you could start selling a car before you physically have it roll off the assembly line but being able to see taking the architectural uh, vertical you're able to see a building a residential or commercial spot before it's been physically built yet before you break ground so that has, from an engineering standpoint, you're able to do simulation and use that 3D asset um, and, and, and test the physics of the, of, the, of the structure, but you're also able to take it in front of a community board or get zoning. But uh, you're seeing in those use cases, uh, specifically for a really complex project, you're starting to see a lot more verticals using them 
in many more ways than simply just seeing it for marketing or selling purposes. For the architectural vertical, um, there are a lot of uh, new uh, companies that are popping up that are using digital twins, high end visualization built using game engines to sell a product or to sell a, a condo, for example, in Dubai before it's broken ground. And you're using those 3D assets either in on an iPad or using them for in VR or rendering out some type of cinematic where you can fly through the structure to, again, help in the marketing for the product. Yeah, one of the things that the car guys hit on really quickly, I think, which is um, sort of echoes to this day, is this idea of um, uh, experiencing a vehicle emotionally. Um, mm -hmm. And so that experiential aspect, be it my experience of what it's like to have the sun streaming mm. in the apartment that I'm thinking of buying and how it lights up in the morning or the experience mm. of what it would feel like to have that leather with that trim on an open road. Like those experiential aspects are just super interesting, aren't they? It is. And if you take that word experiential and, and experience, that is the area that 3D assets are the foundation assets or the foundation uh, tools for bringing an experience to life. And, and experiential is a very broad term as well. Um, our experience team at the mill, for example, uh, incorporates the 3D twin or it, or is the area that this, this uh, offering sits under. And the 3D assets support, when you consider a metaverse experience, for example, you have the world that has been created and then the 3D assets that populate that world. So you have a uh, an e-commerce or some type of a of a of a of a shopping or discovery experience for a brand, and then you have their products, 3D assets of their physical products populating that experience. But then you get into the the idea of like how do you maneuver about the experience? How does the how can to capture that emotion and create those compelling experiences for the users? Those those environments in those worlds, by definition, that is a 3D asset. It's not often what we think of when we consider a 3D twin, but if it is a, a, a uh, uh, you're starting to see a lot more municipalities and cities. I think at CES, there was the promotion of the Las Vegas digital twin of the city. And there's a lot more cities that are doing this now, not just because you have an asset that can be repurposed to show uh, a 3D view map rather than a two dimensional view map of, of the city, but you're also able to create different, uh, 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 marketing events and also be able to sell through those utilizing those digital twins, those 3D replicas of the city. Yeah, I heard somebody. It's very exciting. Talking, sorry. I was going to say it's very exciting. Yeah, no, it is. I, I was talking somebody talking about this and uh, someone was asking them kind of like, I'm a little confused as to how this fits together if you're doing these things. And they summed it up really nicely for me. It's a bit, it's a bit whatever, but they were like, well, the UI is what it looks like. And the UX mm -hmm. is what it does. And the twin comes in where you want to know how it is to experience it. And I thought that was kind of like a nice way of kind of framing it. Because like all those things are important, mm -hmm. of course. But yeah, you're looking at those things. And and then we get into these ideas that in some of those uh, cities and things, you've got sensors that are feeding real-time data. Mm -hmm. um, in factory simulations, they're obviously trying to look not only at what's happening right now, but predict mm -hmm. ahead what's going to be mm -hmm. happening in the production line stuff. And so... Um, automotive in particular, I know, went very far with doing uh, twins in that simulation uh, supply chain slash uh, manufacturing sense. That's all That's all super interesting at, at that level. But the one that really caught my imagination um, is the idea of twins spinning into e-commerce and particularly to fashion. And that's something you've been looking at, isn't it? It is. We, um, we've had a couple of executions that have been uh, supporting fashion shows and from an experience standpoint. Uh, we did a, an, ex an execution from uh, Balenciaga last year where there was a live show, but the show was surrounded by a, a built on Unreal, uh, um, a tunnel that interacted with the models as they walked. Um, but from a physical fashion, imagining you know, this shirt and being able to recreate it and be able to use it for virtual try-ons and use it within a magic mirror or to be able to use it as a replacement for a physical, I'm sorry, to, to, to imagine using it in a digital space to, if not replace 
the physical act of trying a shirt on, but to see it on you, you're starting to see, yes, greater adoption within the fashion space. It's interesting because COVID did a lot to accelerate the adoption within a lot more verticals than pre-pandemic. Pre-pandemic fashion wasn't behind, but it wasn't as um, it wasn't as mature a space as the automotive world was in the use of cab. But now you have a lot more uh, people coming out of um, uh, FIT or Parsons are coming out of fashion schools where they're using CAD in their design process. So you have a lot more people at fashion brands that are fluent in CAD, and that's translating to a lot more uh, foundation assets being at the ready for brands or, or rather for vendors like ourselves to be able to use those assets and then to help visualize those and bring those to life to put them into an experience that could... Um, like you said, like a metaverse type experience where you could have a virtual fashion show, if not virtual try on. Yeah, let's unpack some of that stuff. So obviously one of the things with fashion is how quickly the, de the lead times have become, right? Like obviously back in the day, you'd have the summer collection and then you'd have to wait mm -hmm. all, you know, half a year before you get the winter collection. And now those retailers that are very uh, nimble and agile are being able to sort of sense what the sales figures are doing and feed that in. And, and conversely, they can adjust to fashion trends and fashion forward things to bring those lines on very quickly. But they use, as you say, like basically CAD things to make the clothes in the first place. So that data already exists. Um, but I think it's also a great example, which we had a second ago, because like there's the UI of like, oh, well, there's a page and it has a picture of a shirt. And then you might have a UX. Well, OK, I'm going to show you how this shirt has pockets and how it can be you know, done. And then we're talking about twins. Where you, well, how does it move? How does it look on somebody? How does it look on somebody at night? How does it look on somebody during the day? How does it look on somebody that looks like me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's, mm -hmm. a, that's an incredible kind of quick leap, as you say, with uh, this COVID sense of we can't get out and about, so we're going to facilitate people being able to do this stuff. So, so clients that are coming to you, are they um, like fully aware of what you can do, or is it more like they just have a problem and then you're providing that solution? Like, how aware do you think the clients are at the moment of the capabilities of this stuff? Because it's it's really moving quickly. What it's a very exciting time for a lot of different events that have happened in the last two years. Um, one, to answer your question about where clients are coming at us from, Facebook changing its name put on a lot of people who were unaware of the idea of a metaverse on a map. And so it elevated the overall awareness for a broader audience, not just CMOs and not just not just people who were who were technical, but the general public started to have a better understanding of what that meant. and. And if we imagine that like so much of consumer demand drives innovation, a lot of what happened over the last two years forced a lot of innovation on people who otherwise wouldn't have, have gone down the discovery route to learn about a new way to do something like go into a store and try something on or go into a dealership to test drive a car. When you were forced to do things in a different way, that also started to broaden the overall understanding of what was possible. So you are now limiting or you're kind of lowering the 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 fear or the pushback that you might get from a consumer. So I think overall that that that's been a really remarkable uh, that brings us to a really remarkable situation. The other part that's that's fascinating is that the size of the phone is getting smaller, the speed is getting faster, more can happen on it. The speed of your connection is getting faster, both at home, online, Wi-Fi, um, and and those those are 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 elements that are creating this confluence of of events that have brought us to this place where a lot is happening now, and you also have a lot more brands being more nimble and more flexible and more open to trying something different. Again, influenced by not just what happened over the last two years, but also by consumers that are asking for, right? that are not making the trip into the physical brick and mortar as much as they were. And, and somehow some of those buying beha behaviors have been forever changed. And that's a really exciting thing because brands have, in fashion, for example, I'd say again, fashion was probably not a laggard, but they were not as mature as other industries in the use case of 3D 
or or the idea or, or of of using a 3D asset of their product. But I would say that they are much more forward in some respects than the automotive space in the adoption of NFTs in using replacing physical events with digital events and being able to really push the the idea and the concept along. I mean, Balenciaga coming out with that video game um, built in Unreal uh, recently that was that was very mind blowing because it was an extension of the brand. That experience was an extension of what the brand represented. And I think you're seeing, well, you're seeing a, a bit of a, uh, of a, well, look at him, look at her, look at what they're doing and, and how are you going to top that and that expectation and the same, same with like music, um, seeing what Travis Scott did, where at one point he had 13 million concurrent views and his Fortnite concert, that, that again, mind blowing moment where people looked around and said, well, what, what physical place could hold 13 million people at one time to do it? So there's there's beyond just simply replicate. I think pre-pandemic, there was the idea of um, limited thinking in by brands about what the user, what their customers or future customers might be willing to experience or to get involved in. They see things like the Travis Scott experience or they see this Balenciaga video game experience and they start understanding that it's not just trying to replicate or simulate a physical experience, but rather a way some a way that you can utilize experience or you could utilize spatial experience or this metaverse that's coming in a way that goes beyond what you've done previously but extends the brand and it makes it attractive to not just the younger set but also a utility yeah it's it's interesting like uh, we heard a story of one uh, brand because you were talking about uh, a moment ago digital tryons and stuff mm. and uh, i was really you know stunned because of course i was thinking that this was all about selling more and they were like pointing out to me there's a couple of things that i hadn't really stopped to think about firstly they were like well actually because the try on stuff works so well we just have less returns so we right. make a ton of money or rather save it from just right. not having returns which in the e-commerce world is a you know really large um overhead and then the other one that uh that i thought was really like interesting is this idea that for a lot of these uh, fashion brands, and even for those away from fashion, some of these things that we're talking about aren't about making it a more efficient process. It's not like finding a way to cut my time from turning up at the site to checking out to be less time. It's the exact opposite, really. They want you to linger. They want you to have an app where mm -hmm. all of their products are all that you see and that you hang out there for a while looking at stuff and then mm -hmm. share stuff with friends. And mm -hmm. like, it's not, uh, it's not an efficiency play. And I think sometimes it's easy to fall into that sort of thing with uh, some of this e-commerce stuff, imagining that it's about just going for the sale where actually mm -hmm. that brand personality, that experience and everything causes you to kind of build more of a relationship, uh, which is where I think your work is so fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great point because the again going into the consumer behavior that has in so many ways been forever changed over the last two years. Um, I mean, the idea that 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 you'd have uh, uh, delivery of groceries, for example. I know this isn't digital twins, but you saw a buying behavior that was forced on people, and delivery of groceries was growing at like less than one percent a year. Then you had almost everybody doing it. Well, not, that became such a convenience for people that they can't imagine going back. And one of the ideas beyond just simply the selling, but to take that one track, the way that you can you can visualize the an accessory or you could visualize um, uh, an upsell of a product or of an order and do it in a digital way so that you can have carry less stock but also be able to showcase what the possibilities are beyond what you have capacity for in a store to show. So being able to have more merchandise, be able to show the opportunity of what is available in total, not just what you have in store is, is, is brilliant. And you're starting to see more of that, um, that kind of the, the, the digital upsell in a physical space to be able to see, well, let me see what the car rack looks like on that vehicle using a uh, an image tracking so i have an app that can showcase all of the uh the accessories that are available for that gla that's in the corner that is a 2018 um and we might not have one but we can find a dealership that has one and get it to you um uh, it's 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 a very again it's an exciting time because you're you're seeing more of 
the opportunity of what you can use it for beyond gimmicky. It starts to become a true utility. Yeah, because if you think about a fashion magazine and like a fashion editor, they're not showcasing one item. They showcase uh, like a combination of items, right? Like a, a fashion forward sort of view of this goes with this goes with this in this context, yeah? And even mm-hmm. if you think about walking into a store, like the mannequins in the window display of times of gone mm-hmm. by wasn't just, oh, this is a pair of jeans and there's nothing else there. They'd be like this pair of jeans with this pair of shoes, with this shirt. Mm-hmm. Doesn't that look great? This is the ensemble. This is the kind of statement they're making. And I think it's really interesting getting back to your first point about at scale. It's like now anyone can be looking at those combinations and say, hey, I'm thinking about these jeans. What does it look like with the jacket I bought from you guys last mm-hmm. week? Um, mm-hmm. And and I think that's astounding, like that kind of flexibility, uh, that interactivity. But as you say, doing it at scale in a meaningful way is like huge. Yeah, and it also, the, as you're describing that, it, it, it reminds me of um, a lot of conversations that in the last, uh, I'd say 18 months, Machine learning and AI are has has been a, a buzzword for, I think, the general public, um, more of a marketing gimmick, and they, they haven't really seen what the utility of AI is. The practical side of AI is that it allow it helps it helps people make better decisions because it's taking a great deal of information and then it's it is condensing that information and being able to through algorithms and. And 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 other ways that are well beyond my 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 capacity, um, but a lot of these tools and in, in an area that has been really interesting in the last again eighteen months two years is the use of digital twins and imagery of products to feed or train machine learning applications so that they can be better able to pre- make predictive uh, analysis. Um, I've been involved in projects where you have for the insurance industry where you'd be able to take out your phone and be able to scan the damage of, a, of an accident and then it'd be able to give you a rough idea of how much the damage was or to be able to start a claim at the point of an accident. And what that application needs is hundreds of thousands of images of a perfect bumper, a cracked bumper, a pushed in bumper, a bumper at low light, no light, uh, bright light, uh, sunset you, you all of the different variables that would impact the visual representation of that that vehicle and then also what does it look like when it's perfect what does it look like when it's deformed when it's missing all of these elements have to be fed into this the, the machine learning same thing for fashion too right not only just being able to simulate clothes there are a, a lot of great physics engines now that are able to simulate the drape of a blouse or to simulate um leather or uh, that's more more the light side of it, but but the physics behind materials and how they they act or how they deform, for example, that that becomes really exciting, and you're seeing a lot of use cases. And in fact, uh, projects that are coming in for us are based on the idea of we'd like to create a model that we can use for training that won't ever be seen by the public, but we want to create this type of environment or we want to create this suite of, of products. It's something that is that additional use case of, of digital twin that get, is getting really exciting. These are the th- these are the areas of digital twins that are never seen by the general public, but are being used in ways to make the experience for the end user more, more better, uh, to, to say it incorrectly, just to make a better shopping experience or to make a better insurance experience right to make it more seamless another area um, a, a project that 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 I've uh, worked on was the idea of being able to uh, check in your leased vehicle so you're coming up on uh, in March your vehicle's got to be returned what if you could start the process of returning that vehicle now uh, it costs a dealer so many dollars every day that it sits in the lot before it gets resold as certified pre-owned what if we could start that process now and start and find out what is missing on that car that I need to 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 replace or what would I need to fix before I could put it out on my lot, I could reduce that time that it is actually sitting there and or if not sell it before it's even back. Right. So there's the the ancillary and tertiary use cases of digital twin is the part where the um, it gets really, really exciting for folks because you're starting to see the cost of production for the asset 
it starts to when it's amortized over time and it's repurposed so many times, that's when brands start to see true value. So we've talked about the uh, fashion, we talked about cars and a few other things, but I guess what we're leading to when we start talking about the metaverse is the need to have a digital twin of me, or at least mm -hmm. I'd like some kind of twin of me, some representation of me. And so mm -hmm. that's kind of the logical conclusion, isn't it? That that I may want a twin. Where, where do you sit on that kind of world and what's the state of the art on actually having people? Well, that, that gets into what, many people default in their mind when they hear digital twin, their thought is, oh, a digital representation of me, right? Um, and what is an avatar? And, 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 and the fun thing about um, the mill is that we have a long history of creating digital humans for film and television, for broadcast. And a lot of that work that was done simulating fur or simulating uh, hair uh, has been born out of a lot of R&D out of a need to do something that 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 they don't know how to needing to do something that the filmmaker sees in their head to bring that idea to life but to, but there's but the there's no way that you can create a unicorn so we're going to have to create it digitally so the process of creating the tools and R&Ding their way through the discovery of how to create what looks and appears for all intents and purposes as a living unicorn um, that process is part of our dna um, and but if you fast forward the, the thing about that traditionally over the last say you know a couple of decades that we've been doing that is that it's pretty pretty high in cost it's not a an easy um it's it's, it's not it's, been at it's, scale <laughs> It's not good at scale, correct? Yeah, you you need a budget if you're going to create. Yeah, the Lion King in CGI, you know, that's not something that you just make in a day. Um, however, uh, projects like um, Unreal's Meta, Meta Human, um, they're now getting to the point where, and, and this is the other fun part about this space, is that uh, going back to that confluence of technologies, is that you have game engines and you're seeing rapid iteration and rapid versioning of Unreal, for example, and where they're utilizing a lot of the learnings that for their initial use case or their initial purpose in gaming, they're able to take those learnings and apply them in ways beyond games. And so you have the MetaHuman, and that's very interesting. Um, you also have in just being able to use your phone and being able to get a scan of somebody, photogrammetry, being able to capture somebody. There's a number of studios that are popping up um, around the world where people, you go in to get scanned and then you have this 3D asset that can be rigged and that can be um, brought into experiences. Again, a, that, that idea of that photorealistic. So there's a couple of areas within the space that are interesting. You have that alt space kind of avatar that is more like a Fisher Price, simple, childlike kind of execution all the way down to the to the I want to have a a human that is a digital human that is beyond the uncanny valley that is a a one-to-one -one facsimile so that spread in different use cases is we're still wrapping our head around what it is that they would be used for in the use cases but it's exciting and it is within our purview and it is within our asks I think traditionally, if you look at um, like mascots, we've done quite a bit of mascot work in in particular, I'm thinking Bubble, um, for a telecommunication company in uh, in the UK, creating a mascot and then bringing that mascot to life. Technically, that is a digital twin. The, the Bubble doesn't exist in real life, so you're going through the process of creating this mascot and then giving it life and giving it movement, giving it emotion. Um, that, from an advertising perspective. Um, is is really exciting. It's an area of strength of ours. But the the part that you're getting at as well when you open up that conversation is, well, what if I don't need to have a model or a mannequin online when I'm looking at a shirt? Why can't I just get a scan of myself and then and then dress that digital version of myself in the clothes so that I can see what it looks like and and then using the algorithm find what is going to be the appropriate size, the appropriate measurements, and and remove a lot of the guesswork and a lot of the returns that happen uh, traditionally. 
Yeah. So one of the ones I think is uh, interesting, which I don't think we've really seen um, uh, really spun out yet fully is like a medical digital twin where we're looking at like getting that data and producing a kind of a, a, uh, a version of me that's that's going to be of aid to understanding where I may have medical issues moving forward and and uh, stuff. And so you've got that at kind of like an analytical level. Mm -hmm. And as you say, the other end, you've got these really fun uh, kind of uh, just, you know, insanely uh, fast, nimble characters and stuff that uh, that you can do stuff with. Um, which brings me to a, a new topic, which is uh, in this space, if I had mm -hmm. my own avatar, my own mm -hmm. presence, um, I'd want to have some security on that. and But then I'd also mm -hmm. like to be able to use it in multiple places. I think at the moment we've got a lot of these uh, digital uh, twin concepts still in the early days sort of locked to the specific um, maybe a use case, but mm -hmm. maybe you could talk about NFTs because once I have an NFT, I could effectively yeah. validate that I've got my mic and I could have my mic in my car as a digital assistant and I could mic, mic on my computer as a digital assistant and I, I would own that, but it would be safe because we could validate it was me uh, with NFTs. Uh, there's areas of, 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 of this topic that get really scary that idea of the different simulations that you've seen online or of Obama saying something that did not, he didn't actually say, or being able to uh, uh, create an avatar of a living person to do something that it hasn't, didn't really do. And there's a lot of malicious executions that would be possible uh, that are scary and, 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 and require a, a, a real serious, uh, security examination and i and and but to that point there's also the idea of safely being able to qualify possibly through a blockchain um that that per, that avatar is you and it isn't being misused or it hasn't been um repurposed or, or doing something or, or somebody's impersonating you digitally that's going to be a security issue that will certainly have to be addressed um a little bit beyond my scope because that's just a world that's that, yeah, that no, is, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's what's, it's what's coming. I guess the thing is you, you have to probably stay in front of so many of these topics. Cause I imagine that clients are coming to you saying we want to do this stuff, but we're worried about it being misused. We want to do this stuff and make sure it's, uh, ethically appropriate to people. And, mm -hmm. uh, so there must be a whole dimension to your work, just making sure that the work that's done is considerate and respectful of, of what's uh, required by your clients. My if I'm doing my my role well, it's to be able to identify where the possible um, issues may lie and being able to point us in the right direction of the people, the, the experts that can come in to advise appropriately. We're fortunate to be to have a lot of um, people internal, but also a very broad network of um, industry leaders that we can call on for that, not just like in the NFT and the block space, blockchain space, we do have people in sure. house that are able to manage that. Um, but I think that security, given that so much of our work on from the traditional visual effects requires an element of security, it is in our DNA to to think in those terms uh, from the outset, how to manage assets appropriately so that they don't get hacked or they don't get stolen or they don't get repurposed, uh, they don't get ransomed. Um, so we do have a robust security team to be able to manage some of those elements. Um, but I think, again, in the future, the the ability to, uh, whether it's an algorithm that is able to um, pass over a piece of media to say whether it is legit or not, and I've read about that, um, these are areas that are getting really complex and, and usually are led by people with a PhD at the end of their name. And also the same way of like having that team of people at your end. One of the other things that you guys provide is that ability to actually scale the back end, as it were, right? Because um, you don't want to come up with some incredibly killer stuff and then it it is, uh, the, the server goes down, the the app crashes, the, you know, like right. a, a lot of these things, they seem, well, you just put it on the cloud or whatever it is, but like mm -hmm. that back end um, gets, it's obviously improved a lot, but also the expectations have been raised a lot. Yeah, it's the, the interesting thing as an observation, um, I'd say over the last 10, 12 years, 
was that even five years ago, the ads that would come across uh, come across the, the desk would be uh, from an automotive perspective, take our CAD data, visualize it, return us back these assets, and then we will use them as configurators online. We'll use them by our agency of record. We'll, we'll use these assets in a way that um, is, is after you created the, the created them. Uh, so it was much more of a binary type ask. It was much more, sim it was simple. The asks that come across today are, we need to understand who is your cloud partner. We need to understand what game engine and why. We need to understand um, the production, your production, how it's going to be laid out and how you're going to funnel it. And then what is the FTP? They're, they're just a lot more complex. And part of that is one part of what we've been talking about for, for this conversation. The use cases are growing but also the expectations of the brands are growing with those use cases. And also those use cases are growing by the demand of the, the end user. So it's not just about hosting it. It's about serving that asset as well. How can we maintain the highest number of polygons and deliver the highest quality uh, experience for the user? And that expectation comes with a lot of responsibility. Again, beyond just simply who is going to be, uh, where are you going to host this? But we'd like to bring them into the conversation early on because we're talking about a multi-year engagement that will have a lot of complexity in it that we need to solve from the outset, but that the architecture is going to be driven in part by what the end use case. Why are we going to go with Unity instead of Unreal? Why are we going to go with something beyond neither of those and go in some other area? Um, and, and also being able to, going to the nature of the digital twin of being able to optimize it for any platform. I'm, I'm really glad you brought that point up because you, you, you touched on it really early, early in our discussion and I wanted to come back to it. This idea mm -hmm. that these assets get used in multiple places, this idea of transmedia, like you're mm -hmm. having to solve this with a, with not, uh, I'm just going to do my thing in my lane and I don't care about you. You're doing yeah. this thing in a, in a really integrated digital world. Yes, it, it's, it's, it's creating a need for um, for the vendor for 3D assets at scale to have a greater capacity beyond just artists. So you're you're seeing uh, not a bifurcation in 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 terms of um, well, let me let me rephrase that. You're seeing a, a a need now for people who can manage that level of complexity and scale and be able to be the Sherpa and and to be able and the guide through this new world of the metaverse or web three and 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 all of these different ideas that are really not yet fully formed but are being they're at least on people's minds. And how do you solve for that or prepare for that? How can you future proof your current needs or your current production for that future state that is not yet formed? Um, I don't think that we're all going to be in headphones or or headsets rather. Uh, for the metaverse, I think that it will continue to evolve and it would be something that is accessed in many different ways. I mean, there's already versions of the metaverse through uh, Roblox or through Decentraland or through Fortnite. Different gaming experiences are their own little universes that people access at different times, multiple people accessing them. Um, and alt space is a form of a spatial experience with multiple users in it. But as it evolves, again, that need beyond just simply a vendor there are there is still space i think for somebody who can just return back this in as a 3d asset um but you're also seeing in part of that confluence of events in this exciting time that we're in now you're seeing so much automation that is being layered into the process beyond just simply being being able to make it more lifelike you're seeing several steps that are being executed now without the need for the artist and it gives it to the artist more time to work on other elements of bringing those 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 assets to, to to life. I mean, we've been talking about this, and some of it sounds a little kind of futuristic and out there. Mm -hmm. But by the same token, you guys are doing so much actual work. Um, one mm -hmm. of the things that I think is kind of interesting is where the the line stops and starts between an avatar, like a digital person, and just what I might call digital makeup. And I think I heard somewhere you guys just in uh, like kind of filters or Snapchat filters or, you know, whatever, 
had an astonishing number of these in the last uh, COVID period. How many? How many of you guys done of those kind of things? The exact number is over a thousand at wow. different filters that have been created. Um, a lot of them were created for um, makeup and beauty, um, but we've done a lot of work with Snap. We've done a lot of work with Meta. Um, the the interesting part of that is that it's a it it gives a great foundation for the types of executions that are coming online or the expectations that people have of those filters to to be not only face tracked and and to and to work but to fuel or supply the idea of what is possible or what other brands want to be able to achieve looking at that uh, uh, experience and that is those executions. I mean, I'm just so impressed at how much stuff you've actually done because, you know, I mean, like it's easy for people to kind of, you know, like you get these people and I don't, I'm not really a fan of them, uh, that call themselves futurists and they sort of discuss, mm. oh, you'll be in the future able to do this and this in like five years. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, you know, kind of whatever. I can't predict what I'm going to have for, for lunch tomorrow yet alone. Right. Like right. But, but, what I do know is that if you've got people, like a team, as we've been discussing, that's actually doing it, then mm -hmm. you get these insights from actually doing yeah. it that give you those aha moments of, hey, what about mm -hmm. this? Um, and, and I think that's it. Like, I mean, having that, because like, as much as this is new stuff, you guys have an enormous number of runs already on the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th just to the part about predicting the future and, and what does it look like, um, What's exciting to be receiving the briefs and to look at the RFPs that companies are coming to us with in 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 their thinking is that it is it is three to five years out is when they're looking to bring it online. So you have companies that are seriously thinking and putting serious money and time and resources into how we will shop or discover, serve, all of those elements are being thought out right now. And I, I heard really an Apple exciting. guy once talk, like one of the founding yeah. guys in the way, way back in the day at an early talk. And he said, if you want to see the future, look in the labs now, because this mm. isn't stuff that comes out of thin air. This isn't some futurist just imagining stuff. This comes mm. from actually working through and developing stuff up with long, with long range plans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think that a challenge that I've seen, and I've been guilty of this as well, um, a challenge that brands have when they're thinking about a future experience for a customer or the future experience of, uh, of, of, of discovery or buying their product, it's easy to use, get caught up using legacy terms and legacy ideas in predicting the future. And that Henry Ford quote, right? The 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 if you if if I asked people what they wanted in a car, they'd say they wanted a faster horse, or if they wanted in transportation, they'd want a faster horse. That idea is is interesting because it still plays out today. And when a brand like an Apple comes out with fill in the blank, and the world sees it, they have these the sense of oh yeah, that makes sense. But the years that go into developing something that is beyond what is being done today or is leagues ahead of the way that we currently do it, that is a that is a really exciting uh, it's really exciting when you get to see it and when you get to see the future progress and move forward. But I think again, getting caught up in legacy terms, and that's a that's a the the a challenge that in the discussion, in the early discussion with digital twin with a brand is is to be able to uh, uh, provide an idea of, I know you want to use this asset just for your e-commerce site, but we could also use this for training or we could use this for, and, and this is where like the health sciences and medical, there, I've been involved in a number of conversations in the past where you have um, medical devices that the, the, the brand is looking to create the digital twin of it. And the use cases start with, I want to show a patient what this will look like when this this knee replacement will look like in their own knee and then and show them how it works or i want to show them i've seen a, a a digital heart and seen this is a septic heart this is a damaged heart or this is a ventricle that has to be replaced and then doing a cutaway doing things that you're just are impossible to do with traditional photography or traditional production but being able to show something something and have it, it use that 
asset as a pedagogical tool or to use it in medical school or to be able to use it in front of the patient or to use it online um, or to use it for training for the doctors. That you're starting to get into all of the different use cases to expand their mind for what that can be used for. And again, it helps to solve for the financial discussion. How much is this going to cost me? When you measure how much that cost is going to or how much it's going to cost to produce these assets at scale with, well, how much are you, you how much will this replace traditional photography? right or or traditional ways that you're doing this or is there a better way that we can train our doctors or our nurses using these assets and using these um, immersive experiences yeah i mean i know uh research teams in la that are you know been making now for, for a little while actually sort of virtual patients so that trainee doctors can train and pick up on things that would be completely inappropriate to have them dealing with with a real person. And similarly, uh, you know, you you need to have a very accurate kind of model of what those um, symptoms are so that they can pick it out. But yeah, if somebody's trying to see past somebody to discover that a young woman has been sexually abused and that that's beneath the surface, then you need to have just a whole different level of simulation and stuff. Um, I think that stuff's really, really worthwhile, and there is a lot of, um, uh, of value that we don't think we've seen yet. But as you say, it's it's very easy just to fall into that trap of saying, well, I've got this thing here, so I'll just make a digital copy of it, and then it'll work like the the real world one. And we do want it in some senses to be able to do that, but in another sense, um, it's it's magical. I mean, it really is magical watching how much when you're interacting with some of these things, it changes that experience and uh, how much you go into a different realm when you're able to do these things. Um, with that kind of, as you said before, like that nexus of interactivity, mobile, high computing, high uh, sort of uh, GPUs providing us with much better uh, visualization, and then just add in that machine learning and AI so that we can have statistical inference to to get us that uh, extra level of insight. It's um, It's a it's a huge um, combination of things that are coming together. So how is that managed at your end? Like, is that, you, do you have sort of cross-functional teams that come together? Like I say, I came to you with a complicated new twin project. Are you putting teams together cross-functionally, cross geo regions? Like, how does that actually work? Well, I think to the point I, I, I made just a couple of minutes ago, a lot of the asks that are coming through are more complex than they were even five years ago. Yeah. And part of that, again, is because the, the 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 use cases or the client is coming in with a list of use cases that are already in their mind. And so to manage that complexity, um, solution architecture for how to create that production pipeline is one aspect of it and having a robust team or, or robust set of partners that we can draw from to help us at the very early stage to create um, a solution or a production that can be be managed at scale is important. Um, I'd say that we're, we're, we're fortunate because we have a very broad network of technical partners that own their lane or own the area uh, an expert in their space, <clears throat> software, I mean, hardware, you, platform. Your team, you know, you, you know, the way you've been talking, like you're getting really informed stuff coming to you from your clients. But I was mm -hmm. kind of expecting you to say that you had an educational role to educate them because... Oh. Um, but I mean, maybe not. Like maybe I'm uh, misinterpreting the level of uh, understanding already out there. No, you you are you're actually striking on a point uh, that's actually an area of growth for us in is the idea of consulting. The idea of we're looking for assistance and bring your expertise to help us solve an R and D our way through a solution before we get to uh, scale in, on on our own. So helping a platform or helping a brand create a new shopping experience, for example, those requests not the production, but almost that discovery phase of, can you help us go from zero to one? And then when we get to that one and we have a proof of this concept, then we want to be able to ex go one to 10,000. But getting that zero to one can often take a long time to just kind of work out, well, we think we want to do this, but through testing and discovery, we found out that actually this is the direction that we have to go in. That's an area that we that we pull from internally to help with. And those those very specific projects are coming in more more frequently 
And and just as a quick aside, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but like, how are you finding your team? Like, is is there any particular disciplines or ways? Because I know your background is like very varied, and and obviously you've got a huge amount of experience. Mm-hmm. But like to staffing up and bringing people in, like, is there any? Or if somebody's listening to this and they're interested in in getting into this, like, any words of advice? Um, well, from a office standpoint, we are the mill itself is about fifteen hundred strong and we have offices in um our 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 larger uh studios right now in london new york and la um we have other offices in chicago um seoul shanghai uh, bangalore uh we in uh, paris but we have a network that stretches much of the globe that we draw from that have talent that has certain uh specialties within each but collectively we support projects that come in the door Um, the, to, for, to the question about getting into this space and what, what is interesting and how to prepare, I, I don't think, I mean, computer science will always have a place in the world, but I think a lot of what we do being fluent in game engine is comes to mind right away. I think that the use and the expanded use of game engines is really exciting, not just for, um, not just in the, in, in, in the, like the interactivity or, or as a as a platform for the end user but also in filmmaking you know going back to our traditional side when you look at projects like the mandalorian or um other film projects where you have virtual backgrounds in real time on a set <clears throat> that's using game engines and and like the balenciaga execution i was telling you about where you're creating a a real-time example or a real-time backdrop to a, a live event there's a lot more use cases here and a lot of that is being uh, run through the game engines. And so fluency in game engine is, is one thing. I think the other is the awareness of um, uh, the awareness of cloud, being able to understand better, not just what kind of the instances, what it means to host up in the cloud, but also all of the expanded use cases. So understanding how um so much more is happening rendering up in the cloud virtual workstations up in the cloud so understanding the fundamentals there is is a lot more a part of what our solutions look like today than they did five years ago uh i think the other thing you mentioned ux and ui the 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 acronym that i'm seeing a lot more is sx which is the spatial experience understanding Hmm. understanding how spatial experience and 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 how it which is fundamentally different than a two-dimensional uh, HTML5 page today, but understanding three DOF and six DOF, and understanding the impact that um, not just how somebody moves through an environment, what that impact means, but also what that spatial experience means to the way that the user will interact with a product, with a digital twin, right? What do you need that digital twin to do when it's in that experience? That has huge influence on not only how it's produced, but then how it is served or delivered on the end state. So uh, there isn't any one area that I would suggest that is, you know, know this one area and you can just dive into this space. It The people who I've seen that are successful today have a, a varied background and, and, and have multi-disciplines, but the fundamental understanding that they're bringing to the work today is has been over the evolution of a lot of the softwares and a lot of the the tools that were used to create uh, visualization over the last 10, 20 years. And <clears throat> as those evolve, a lot of the fundamentals stay the same, but some of the more interesting people that I meet in this space have that kind of, have that varied background. Um, and they also bring a lot of the excitement to where we are today. It feels very, today feels very much like New York did in 2000. As an outsider looking in, the only other thing I'd add to that is I think you guys are so agile. You're so like, it's not like we uh, we fear change. You guys are more like, you know, bring it on. Like we expect change. We want change. We're mm-hmm. looking for how to to uh, to move forward. And we only move forward by kind of changing. And I, I think, you know, like it's easy to get this idea that there's some kind of snapshot of exactly where it's at, but it's an evolving landscape. And I, I just applaud the way you guys are so nimble in uh, and so agile in doing that stuff. I am wildly impressed by the talent uh, that here at the mill and also in blown away at the the Super Bowl spots, for example, for this year. We did 
a lot of those spots. And to see the execution and see the various types of executions that were done. And our website has everything that was done this year. But one of the interesting things about it, I was talking to somebody uh, recently, and to your point, there's, you're never done. You're never, you're never sitting on your laurels well enough to say like, okay, I think that we have from a, from a, uh, from an evolution standpoint, R and D, I think we might be done in the learning. You're constantly being pushed because of the demands of the, of, of the, of the clients that come to us. And that's really exciting because it's the, the, those, those projects that push you to do something where you have no idea how to execute on it. You think you might have an idea based on this, this, and this, but this is all new territory. So how are we going to bring this on? That's that's where we grow and we get better, right? So that for the next execution that comes in the door where we have no idea how to, to start, where to start, uh, we lean on the experience that we have in the back. But bringing, bringing uh, this place attracts people with divergent thinking capabilities. The ability to look at something and say, you know, this is a paperclip, or it could pick a lock, or it could fix a pair of glasses. That that type of divergent thinking, when you apply it to visualization, means that it it isn't it. You don't just look at the brief, or you don't just look at a client who says, "I want to create a three D version of this." You start by asking, "Okay, well, why? What do you want to do with that?" And when you have a team of folks that have, bring that type of critical thinking, divergent thinking, however you want to, whatever type you want to uh, 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 title it, um, that helps to suss out what the possibility is beyond what the brief says. Well, William, I want to thank you so much for taking time to talk to us today. We really appreciate it. It's been an exciting chat. Um, it's such a broad area in one sense, but then that's because it's such a uh, a green pasture, open field that you guys are like a space that you've created for us to uh, to enter. So thank you again. Thank you so much.